Hello, I am Christopher Lee Manus and I am reading today for LSU Press's remote author series. I'm thankful to be here and I'm grateful for all of the staff at LSU Press who have helped me prepare for this as well as for the publication of my book. Today I will be reading from my book, Naming the Leper which was published this past February from LSU Press. And my book is uh, about my family history in, lepros in the Leprosarium in Carville, Louisiana. And in that, um, in that institution, five of my relatives, my great-grandfather and his four siblings, were all in what are you doing? It's not the Denver shoulder that's lost. In Carville. Um, while in Carville, they were diagnosed with leprosy, what is today Hansen's disease, and they were uh, confined there. In theory, some people did leave the institution, but um, most of those people left because they were in some kind of remission or they had other health issues that, that made them no longer symptomatic. The reality is, is that leprosy, what is today called Hansen's disease, is, um, is not cured. You can't cure the disease, though it can be treated uh, today with, with multi-drug therapy. And so, but in 1919 to the early 1940s, um, such treatment did not exist. And so anyone confined to Carville, were, uh, any people confined to Carville, in fact, were uh, usually there for a, an extended period of time. In the case of my relatives, they died there. They were not ever cured or um, uh, treated successfully. So today I'll be reading from my book, Naming the Leper, and I'm so thankful for those of you that are still joining us. Um, the way that this reading will occur is that I will read a few poems at a time and then in in dis uh, at different intervals, I will speak about some of the poems and my process in writing them. So thank you all for joining. Uh, we will just get started with uh, the first group of poems from my book, Naming the Leper. These first couple of poems are written um, based on folklore about leprosy or uh, the Leprosarium in Corville, Louisiana. Basically, um, People in the early 20th century, some assumed that leprosy could be caught through mother's milk or cattle milk. It was thought by some you could catch it from fish. There was a, a famous fish theory about how you could catch leprosy. It was thought you could um, catch it from armadillos. It was thought that uh, you could, um, it was thought that the hospital itself was an ostrich form, uh, rather than tell people that a leprosarium was being placed in the middle of Carville, Louisiana. Um, patients and authorities propagated the idea that the, uh, that the place was an ostrich form, and that's why the people were on the grounds as they were breeding ostriches. Never mind that no ostrich was ever actually seen at Carville and no one ever questioned that, but that's still what, you know, the idea became. So these first groups of poems are about the, the legends and oral histories about the hospital as well as uh, leprosy itself. And um, then the, the second poem that I'll actually read also discusses some of the public law that went into uh, creating the institution and uh, 
creating the hospital itself. Tall tales grow limbs, my mother said. In the beginning, the word lived among us, an American mindset, public health policy, and finally flesh. But I was nursing, she said, when it first learned to hiss and move down transoms over my crib, adapted to syllables it had breath and could rattle the underbelly of particulars from cattle milk, which we sipped. No, that can't be it. It must have come from the fish, become the word Turville choked on when he swallowed the fish bone that split his esophagus. At the same time, Corville was said to breed ostriches, and the word took on feathers before anyone corrected it. In the name of my kin, I listened, changed skins, and grew stilts to reach the height of the tallest tree where their spirits nested and the word dwelt in the wind. Public law. These were the procedures concerning leprosy eruptions and ostrich forms in 1917. When a diagnosis was suspected in accordance with paragraph 32.86, the patient in question could not be in contact with people on the street and in the stores. And if the diagnosis was confirmed, a patient had to volunteer admittance to Corville. The way ostrich feathers are clipped begins at six months old, when the bird is as tall as its feathers, has a curved neck, small head, humped back, paddled toes, and an ungainly walk. From that time forth, every six months, the feathers are clipped and sold. At eight feet tall, an ostrich's single leap covers 25 feet. Public health employees at Carville earned additional pay for working with lepers, though by 1906, the medical community believed it to be the least contagious of all diseases. These were the patients never compelled to live under armed guard without the right to vote, to marry, or to live where they might. Those with smallpox and tuberculosis. While in Carville, my great grandfather um, taught the young boys uh, who were in the institution, uh, he created a curriculum so that they could have the semblance of normalcy and go to school while being confined for their disease. So um, we are fortunate that we have a letter that he wrote and he briefly describes in that letter some of what the day-to-day -day tasks were that he did with the boys. So the first stanza of this next poem will actually be um, an excerpt from his original poem, from his original letter. Um, and then the other two stanzas are in fact my own imaginings about that time period based on what I know. Edmond, writing under his Carville name, Gabe Michael, in 1925. Under my lead, House 31 operates with military precision. Kids rise no later than 6.30, dine three times daily, take oil or medicines as ordered, bathe without cursing or vulgarity, are not permitted to smoke or gamble, and write home monthly. Not that anyone on the outside writes back. I love you must be taught in schools and shown in picture shows. More satisfying and oftentimes quicker to watch trees green after winter than bear the burden of a blank page and let its whiteness define time. There is really so little to tell. The other teacher and I have to make the whole day up but we never complain in front of the kids. Instead, we amuse ourselves with seeing the sky through their eyes. Edmond, writing to his wife, Claire. 
Where the ink should have spelled, I love you, there are so many other ways to say I need you. Send money, pray for me, think of me, don't worry or trust. Even an I don't know can substitute for love. If you listen carefully, sound afraid of nothing can break fences, dodge bullets, and cross borders. Words dressed in ink can simulate a voice in lonely quiet or serve as garments from the cold, but your silence hurts. Perhaps I can understand the place you are in, the truth of it. Two kids to raise on your own and no proof this nightmare will wake. Perhaps I know the futility of lending words like their bricks made without straw, fearful the ground will sink from under you or the walls you have built will crumble. I appreciate how light is made from, bulb, from a bulb turned on without encumbrance, the same with love. If we make the effort what is it that galaxies can travel billions of years and still jiggle particles in our eyes? Yet from you there is no saying, no letter, no word. After all these months, only indifference, not silence, not disease, but silence affects our marriage. And the fact is, our children hear it like a snake's rattle hidden in the grass. The next group of poems that I will read um, are from or inspired by letters that my great grandfather Edmond wrote while in Carville and letters that his brother Norbert wrote while he was confined in Carville. If you read this section of my book, Naming the Leper, in uh, in its entirety, the section reads as if a single individual is writing all of these letters. Some letters are addressed to folks, some letters are addressed to Claire, my great grandfather's wife. But as the letters were put together, what I did was take lines from Norbert, lines from Edmond, and I strung together this particular grouping of letters. I tried my best to document what it was they were expressing or explicitly saying so that if Norbert was talking about being lonely, then I tried to also look at lines where my great grandfather expressed those same feelings. So these next poems are, um, are the product of that. Dear folks, I don't know myself. In here they don't use names. On any given day I can be called Cicero, Albert, or James Jackson. I wish you could see me. I've changed. I've grown a mustache and wear a derby and I've tanned. It's all about getting in the dirt and sweating the sickness out. Every time I do, I feel like a new man. Dear folks, an old fellow we are watching die since Sunday has been talking out his head and having convulsions. That flies aren't enough, we are raising our hands in prayer, but pray as we must for mercy. I cannot ask the Lord to cure me. I am just trying to adjust the dead of the place, like Lazarus in his tomb before he could tell what he had seen. I am breathing too much in a cell that has rats, wide planked floors, and dreams spent on looper clips, too much smelling pine. What is the price of the collars you sent? By the way, the old man died. Don't mention it. I've just been in a rut. Last week it was a year since I was on ship bound for France and today I'm here, discharged from the army and stripped of my citizenship, honorably with leprosy, all in the same sentence 
the same year. Tell God he's a hypocrite and then let everything drop dead. That's what he wants, isn't it? Are the nuns at least an excuse for prayer? Dear folks, I'll tell you what you will not find in newspapers. Clara Mertz was going blind and wanted to see her father for the last time. So she wrote and asked, asked him to be on his front porch. She assured him she would not get down or even try to engage in conversation. She just wanted a memory of him. Two days before she was to leave, she received a typed letter from her father's attorney, which read, to whom it may concern, Mr. Mertz's daughter died 30 years ago. We have just about uh, 13 minutes left and I will read one other poem. Um, as I read this poem, if you have questions, you are welcome to type them uh, in the chat and I can do what I can to answer them. Since my book is titled Naming the Leper though, it would be remiss of me not to name not only my relatives, but the women who told my mother their stories, as well as the doctors who participated in their confinement and incarceration at Carville. Um, so this next poem is for all of them. The Book of Names. These are the children of Terville and Lucy Landry by order of birth. Edmond, Norbert, Charlie, Marie, Albert, and Amelie. This is the order they died. Charlie, Norbert, Edmond, Amelie, Marie, and Albert. These are the children of Edmond and Claire, Leonid and Wilbert. This is the order they died, Wilbert and Leonid. These are the names of the women who told my mother the family stories, Sadie Morgan Spencer and Zenobia Raisley. These are the last names of the doctors who participated in Norbert, Edmond, Amelie, Marie, and Albert's incarcerations. Mouton, Sabatier, Johns, Denny, Minges, Fadgett, and Johnson. These are the names of the 1917 Surgeon General and Secretary of the Treasury, Rupert Blue and William Gibbs McAdoo, who carried out Public Law 64299. These are the names Norbert, Edmond, and Amelie chose in confinement. James Jackson, Gabe Michael, and Emily Michael. This is the place Norbert, Edmond, Amelie, Marie, and Albert were forced to live and to die. United States Marine Hospital, number 66, otherwise known as Carville. If you have questions, you're welcome to write them in the margin. Um, while we wait for those questions, I will read one other um, poem. And uh, this poem is uh, written from the point of view of the children that were in Carville um, that my great grandfather taught um, while in the institution. The Children's Letters from House 31. An elephant on the roof each morning. I am just getting started and hope is good. 
After 21,000 days in Carville, believe it or not, Mr. Ripley, a kitten mothering hens was the life of the party. Mama do not believe them. They do not know I can be cured. If a cow can have two heads and be born at the station dairy, I take my bath treatments regularly and say the rosary. Every evening, Hope bends her head at my window and ties her shoes. On a Sunday afternoon, eating stone permits ostriches to grind roughage. From the desert plants and hard objects they consume, Instead of bull, bulls, we hunt birds and gather hyssops. Miss Roma says elephant soup will keep our memory strong and octopus tails will give us muscles. When we can't sleep, Mr. Gabe reminds us to breathe. Count heartbeats, he says. Folks, your hello would be a brush of leaves over a hollering creek. On a dark night, it would be a raft of moonlight. We could fish dreams and cast away nightmares, remembering to breathe together. Thank you so much. Um, I, I want to just say some clarifying um, statements based on some of the questions Laura sent me. Um, one is that patients were not required to take aliases or change their names in Carville. But that seems to have been a fairly standard practice of the patients um, that was certainly not stopped by any of the authorities at Carville. So what would happen is that um, in order to protect the patient's family on the outside, um, many of the patients between, you know, the early 1900s and about the 1940s, 1950s would take on other names so that if they did write home or if they did um, communicate with anyone um, and it was discovered that that communication came from a leprosarium, then, you know, no one's going to know who Gabe Michael is, but they might know who Edmond Landry was. Um, so this seems to have been a fairly common practice. And the other thing that I would just like to say too about the, uh, the, the institution is that um, after about the 1960s or in the 1960s, um, Carville became an outpatient facility. Patients no longer had to uh, go there and be quarantined um, permanently. So they would instead um, go there. And uh, from the 1940s through the present, there have been, you know, every so many years, different drug therapies that have been tried. And then I think, I don't remember the exact year, but in the 1980s, the early 80s, um, an effective drug treatment uh, with, with fairly good results uh, came into being. And so patients tended to go to Carville, be treated, and then they would leave. My family, however, Norbert dies in 1924. My great grandfather enters Corville about uh, a month or two after, uh, several months after Norbert's death that same year. Um, and then my great grandfather was there until 1932. My aunt, my great aunt, Amelie, was there from 1933 to 1940. And then Marie and uh, Albert Landry, also my aunt and uncle, my great aunt and uncle, um, were there from 1941. Um, and then my aunt dies, I believe, in 1965 and my uncle in 1977, and I was born in 1978. So, <laughs> so are there any more questions or comments that you would like to make 
in the margin. I do want to take this time to thank Laura and to thank the LSU staff for all that they have done for me, not only in this um, series, giving me the ability to, to read my poems, but also um, in the publication of my book. This has been a, a remarkable journey for me, and I look forward to many more. So um, thank you all for your efforts, and um, I wish you the absolute best. So, my book is Naming the Leper. You can get it at LSU Press, um, and I believe that in this remote <laughs> stay-at-home quarantine that there are even some discounts that you might be able to get from it on by going to LSU Press's website. Um, I want to thank again my series editor, Ava, for helping me in the edits on the book and Laura for putting all this together and James for doing other marketing and, and things for me throughout the last year or two. So thank you all so much and I have enjoyed this.